Hi, my name is Kevin and I want to be the Universal Champion. Kevin Owens signed his WWE contract on August 12th, 2014. After a pretty gruesome and emotional WWE tryout, I ran to the bathroom, closed the door behind me. My body was just so tired, it was day two. <laughs> Owens would cut a promo so impressive that he immediately knew he was signed once he walked away. Because I'm jealous! But it doesn't matter anymore, because I'm here now. And when I was done, I knew I was hired. This year marks the 10th year that Owens has been a part of the company, and over the years, he's given us some of the most hilarious shush, 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 shush. and incredibly savage moments. Kevin Owens is a former NXT champion, a two-time Intercontinental champion, a three-time United States champion, oh a former Universal champion, and most recently, as of this recording, a former WWE tag team champion. What's up guys, it's Kaze here. If you're a fan of wrestling and wrestling related content, consider subscribing as we're on the way to 5,000 subs and this channel covers wrestling both inside and outside the ring. But without further ado, let's get into it. <laughs> Vignettes of Owen started airing on November 20th, 2014. It wasn't until a month later, December 20th, at NXT TakeOver Our Revolution, where KO would debut in a match against CJ Parker. The less said about him, the better. Later that night, after a year of build-up and falling short, Sami Zayn would finally capture the NXT Championship. He was congratulated in the ring by the entire NXT roster, including Kevin Owens, who is in real life his best friend. The rest of the locker room clears out to give these two best friends a moment. They teamed together on the indies for years and they always had dreamed of making it to WWE. And though this wasn't the main roster just yet, the future for these guys were as bright as the Oh no, a heel turn! Kevin, I was your biggest fan. So Kevin Owens turns on Sami Zayn and ends his first night in the company making a major statement. Now at the time I didn't know who Kevin Owens was, but by the end of that week, I was so invested that I was completely caught up in the KO lore. I found out about his friendship and matches with the Young Bucks, how Sami Zayn was the best man at his wedding, how he grew up idolizing Owen Hart, even giving his son the first name Owen. And let me know if you do this too, but every time I see a new wrestler that I'm not familiar with, I immediately look up their moveset. And KO had and still has one of my favorite movesets in WWE. This one night turned me into a lifelong fan of Kevin Owens. That's how you make a debut matter. After the attack, Sammy was off TV for a few weeks while KO feuded with Adrian Neville, the man that Sammy beat for the NXT Championship. Upon Sami Zayn's return, he was set to face Adrian Neville on the January 14th, 2015 episode of NXT. After winning the match, Kevin Owens would attack Sami Zayn. This set up their match at NXT TakeOver Rival. Now the Kevin Owens we see here is a lot more serious and direct in his delivery. This was prizefighter Owens and he definitely meant business. That means more money, means a better life for my wife, my two children, and myself. Kevin Owens beat Sami Zayn in pretty decisive fashion at NXT Rival. Ironically, he won the match by KO. After delivering three pop-up power bombs and Sammy left unable to continue, fans were expecting this five-star classic. And once they saw that this was Sami Zayn just getting beat down for 20 minutes, the energy in the whole building just shifted. Also that same night, Finn Balor would beat Adrian Neville to become the new number one contender. Kevin successfully defended his title against Finn Balor on the March 25th, 2015 episode of NXT. On the April 1st episode of NXT, Sami Zayn would return and announce that his mixtape was coming out August 5th later that year. <laughs> nah, April Fools, he just challenged KO to a match. In the meantime, Sami would injure his shoulder in a match against John Cena on Monday Night Raw after answering Cena's US Open Challenge. However, he still went on to have the match with KO at NXT TakeOver Unstoppable before being ridden off a of television for surgery. This is also the night Samoa Joe debuted, saving Sammy from a further beatdown. On May 18th, 2015, Kevin Owens would answer John Cena's US Open Challenge. Kinda. He actually went out there, stood face to face with the face that runs the place. I've been doing this longer than you! And actually held his own on the mic. He ended up attacking Cena and giving him a pop-up powerbomb. Wouldn't have let that shit happen to me though. So not only was he feuding with Finn Balor for the NXT Championship, but he also had this pretty damn good feud going on with Cena on the main roster. And it really just felt like KO was must-see TV. Like I said, his moveset is incredible, 
So him being in these matches always felt like something new. In the lead up to his match with John Cena at Elimination Chamber 2015, KO would host his own open challenge for the NXT Championship. Answering the challenge was none other than Zack Ryder. And it went about as well as you thought for Zack Ryder. I mean, he got some offense in, but this was a glorified squash match. He had a great theme song though. Okay, okay. The match was incredible giving it four out of five Don Cheadles, with Kevin Owens coming out with the win. Over the next few weeks, he continued his feud with John Cena while also feuding with the top contenders in NXT, and also MGK. His feud with Cena ended up being a trilogy over that summer. This was the year that John Cena was beating all the You Can't Wrestle allegations, with Cena taking the next two victories. Owens would drop the NXT title to Finn Balor at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn in what was a great ladder match and a great pay-per-view altogether. I get nostalgia just watching it back. Matter of fact, five nostalgic Don Cheadles. After his feud with Cena, KO would go on to feud with Cesaro for a few months. The feud would end about a week after SummerSlam 2015, with KO holding two clean victories over Cesaro. I thought this would be one of those 50-50 booking things, but Kevin Owens was a pretty strong heel up until this point. The following week, he would interrupt Intercontinental Champion Ryback during such a passionate promo. Later that week on SmackDown, Ryback would save Dolph Ziggler from an attack by KO. But first, a message from Rusev. You sissy American Dolph Ziggler jerk skinny little abs and your gift bags. KO would beat Ryback for the Intercontinental Championship at Night of Champions 2015. After raking the eyes and then a surprise roll up, the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. The most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. He successfully defended his title against Ryback, but the title reign itself was pretty lackluster. It didn't pick up until his feud with Dean Ambrose towards the end of the year. I was still waiting for Dean Ambrose to do something major after he split up with the Shield. The narrative behind his character was great, but everything he did just felt so mid. Ambrose would go on to defeat Kevin Owens at TLC 2015, ending his reign at only 48 days. And this feud was actually pretty good. KO would really start to take some crazy bumps. The two had a last man standing match at the 2016 Royal Rumble, and this was just a car crash of a match. KO would even get pushed through two tables during the match. Both men would still go on to compete later that night in the Royal Rumble, this Rumble being for the WWE Championship. This is also the same night where AJ Styles would make his debut. Later in the match, KO would actually go on to eliminate AJ Styles to a ton of fan heat, but was ultimately eliminated by a returning Sami Zayn to a huge pop. Shortly after the Rumble, KO would go on to win the IC title again, this time in a fatal five-way match, consisting of Dean Ambrose, Dolph Ziggler, WWE legend Stardust, and Tyler Breeze. He defended it against Dolph Ziggler at Fastlane, but then would lose it at WrestleMania in a seven-man ladder match to none other than Zack Ryder. And this was a huge victory for Zack Ryder. Maybe the company had finally saw what we had saw all along. Oh, never mind. This was the last time we would see KO with the Intercontinental Championship and Zack Ryder. Kevin Owens held the title for a combined 132 days over the span of two title reigns. And we may never see him win that title again due to the fact that his idol Owen Hart also held the title for 132 days over the span of two title reigns. He's gone on record saying he never wants to hold the title again because of this fact. Now at this point, Kevin was kind of a tweener. He was definitely a heel, but the fans loved him. So after WrestleMania, he began feuding with the one person that no one could boo at the time. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn were put in a tag team match against The Miz and Cesaro in a winning effort. However, after the match, gotcha, bitch. this feud would go on for that whole summer. The two would have a match at Payback, both be involved in a Money in the Bank ladder match that year, and even though both got drafted to Raw, their feud would culminate in a match at Battleground, where Sami Zayn would pick up the win. It was around this time that Kevin Owens would develop a friendship with Chris Jericho. You said you had somebody to watch your back, so who is it? Yeah, Jim and Marvin Luter. You ever heard of Jim and Marvin Luter? That's not a real person. You just made that name up. I got your back. The two would team up in a tag team match versus Enzo and Cass at SummerSlam. Side note, does anybody remember when Enzo got knocked out by the bottom rope? After SummerSlam, KO was shockingly going to win Finn Balor's recently vacated Universal Championship on the August 29th, 2016 edition of Raw. From here, KO would feud with Seth Rollins, and Chris Jericho didn't like how Rollins was popping shit at KO, so for him, he inherited the beef. 
And I'm not gonna lie, these guys were my favorite part of Raw at the time. Chris Jericho had returned earlier in the year and he was doing his regular Y2J shtick at the time and it was getting a bit stale for the crowd. Jericho then began wearing a scarf, putting people on the list. You just made the list! And bringing us all the gift of Jericho. Drink it in, man. During the feud with Rollins, Jericho found himself on the end of a lot of beatdowns while KO mostly ran away. Tired of being KO's lackey, the two would briefly break up for about a week until the worst thing that could possibly happen, happened. Somebody has stolen the list of Jericho. KO would come out and offer Jericho some help like a true friend before they were interrupted by Seth Rollins holding the list. And with a bit of foreshadowing, Seth Rollins would state that KO's name was at the top of the list of Jericho. Throughout the night, Jericho would search aimlessly throughout the locker room searching for his list until he finally found it in the hands of Braun Strowman. Say please. And after the power of please came into play, Jericho would finally get his list back. That's the power of please, kids. Rollins would beat KO and Jericho later that night, setting up a match between Rollins and KO and Hell in a Cell for the Universal Championship. And it was a pretty good match. Four out of five Don Cheadles. KO was way more brutal than he usually was up until that point on the main roster, and Rollins has always been a solid performer in the Hell in a Cell. I feel like his Hell in a Cell match against The Fiend really leads people to forget how good he was in these matches, but they're definitely still worth a watch. KO went on to win the match due to interference from Jericho, and it really seemed like things were going well for these two friends. They ended up being captains for the Team Raw Survivor Series, and it was during this match that KO would hit AJ Styles with the list of Jericho, causing Jericho to get distracted and be eliminated, and ultimately leading to Team Raw losing the match. It was the next night on Raw where all fans expected the final blow up between KO and Jericho, and the two would argue in the ring about who was to blame for the loss at Survivor Series, until they both came to the conclusion of who it actually was. Roman Reigns! After a number of interferences, Roman Reigns would call KO a false champion, says the only reason he has the title is because of Jericho. This would get in Kevin Owens' head, and he got angry at Jericho and told him he could win without him. KO would face Roman at Roadblock, where Chris Jericho ran in and hit KO with a codebreaker, meaning Owens retained by disqualification. And turns out this was all a part of their plan. The interference got so bad that Raw GM Mick Foley decided to put Jericho in a cage suspended above the ring in KO's next match against Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble. And this match was absolutely insane. Probably my favorite Roman match up until that point. I wasn't really a fan of the big dog, so matches like these at least showed me he was good in the ring. KO would come out with a win after an attack by Braun Strowman and take some insane bumps in the process. Two weeks later, after putting Tom Brady on the list, Tom Brady, you just made the list! Goldberg would then come out to challenge Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho for the Universal Championship. Goldberg was fresh off of his one minute match with Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series, and this was gonna be his second match back. Chris Jericho would kinda crash out and say that KO can beat Goldberg all by himself. You got a match at Fastlane versus Kevin Owens for the WWE Universal Championship. Just like KO had been saying for months that he didn't need Jericho to win any match. This causing even more dissension between the two. The next week on Raw, in order to make it up to Kevin Owens, Chris Jericho would throw the Festival of Friendship. It consisted of dancers, artwork, and KO even got Jericho a new list. How come my name's on this? This was one of WWE's best gotcha, segments bitch. of that decade. And dare I say the first time a heel turned heel. Goldberg would go on to squash KO in a less than five minute match at Fastlane becoming the Universal Champion in the process. Now this Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho feud was supposed to be one of the main events for that year's WrestleMania, but plans would change once they realized Goldberg was willing to work with them again. Could you imagine if some part-timer just came in and took Cody Rhodes' spot? Oh wait, never mind. All wasn't lost though, as Chris Jericho would still have the US Championship that he won in a handicap match against Roman Reigns. The two would face off at WrestleMania for the United States Championship in a pretty underwhelming match. A match that KO, Jericho, and Vince McMahon, the guy who booked the whole thing, were all pretty disappointed by. After WrestleMania 33, the superstar shakeup led Kevin Owens to the SmackDown brand. However, he showed up as the US champion, claiming oh to be God. the face of America, and looking like Jim Halper just took his fiance. And KO's US title run was probably my least favorite time of his career. He only defended the title against three people, Chris Jericho, AJ Styles, and that one time against Gary Gandy. 
After losing his title on the July 25th episode of SmackDown to AJ Styles and two more weeks of screwy finishes, KO started to believe that SmackDown commissioner Shane McMahon was the reason behind all his misfortunes. This caused him to completely crash out on SmackDown, calling out Shane McMahon for abusing his power and saying Stephanie McMahon would never. And I don't know about that. After a few weeks of back and forth attacks, the two would have a match set for Hell in a Cell. But before then, KO just beats the shit out of Vince McMahon. Even Sammy was trying to confront him, but it led to KO doing the same to Sami Zayn. So the match at Hell in a Cell was a pretty good one. I feel like people more so remember the ending of the match rather than the actual match. And it might be because Sami Zayn saves KO from an elbow off the cell aligning himself with Kevin Owens and effectively turning him heel. Now, I wasn't sure where WWE was going with this, but I was willing to let them cook. Sami Zayn as a babyface was starting to get a bit old. Sami would explain his reasoning behind this being that he had been a good guy for so long and it hadn't gotten him any success. The two would go on a feud with SmackDown's authority figures, Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan. And they did this by jumping Shane McMahon and robbing people backstage. You're gonna give me those bracelets you have there, take them off? Nah, I want that handkerchief too for the vertigo comment last time. And all I'm saying is, if you still support these two after that, then give me your wallet. The two were mostly put in matches against Randy Orton and Shinsuke Nakamura. I hated that pairing. And we also got moments like Kevin Owens and Sammy occupying SmackDown and the Yep movement. Shane McMahon is the worst McMahon of them all. Yep. On the March 13th episode of SmackDown, Shane McMahon would announce that he was stepping down from being SmackDown's commissioner. And the following week, it was announced that Daniel Bryan was officially medically cleared to compete. This news was met with an immediate beatdown. Daniel Bryan even took that apron powerbomb spot, a crazy thing to return to, even though he's taken much worse since. This all culminated in a match at WrestleMania 34 between Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn versus Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan. And after losing the match, the two would become free agents, leading to Kurt Angle's hilarious But I hear that TNA is hiring line, and this lesser known insane line by KO and Sami Zayn. You got like five kids? You forgot Jason Jordan. Kurt kind of forgot about him too. By the way, Kurt, you look ridiculous in that lawn chair. They would finally secure two roster spots on Raw, and KO would soon qualify for the Money in the Bank ladder match, eventually won by Braun Strowman, and the two began to feud. However, I can't tell if this was a serious feud or not because we got moments like these. Anybody in there? And if you didn't see any of that, it's because YouTube made me take it out. But Braun Strowman flipped another car. The feud led into a steel cage match at Extreme Rules where KO was thrown off the cage and ended at SummerSlam in what was pretty much a squash match. The next night on Raw, KO would obviously lose an IC title match to Seth Rollins. And after the match, looking completely beat the fuck up. I quit. He just quits for about a week. Then he comes back to beat up Bobby Lashley. This led to him teaming up with Elias and facing John Cena and Bobby Lashley at Super Showdown. And shortly after that, it was announced that he would be taking time off after undergoing surgery on both knees. On February 26, 2019, Vince McMahon would announce that instead of Kofi facing Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship at Fastlane, it was going to be a returning Kevin Owens with new tattoos and everything. And despite replacing super mega babyface Kofi Kingston, KO was actually a babyface for the first time in his WWE career. Turns out WWE actually rushed the decision for him to come back because they didn't trust the Kofi and Bryan match. We really almost didn't get Kofi Mania. It's crazy. So with WWE actually going through with the Kofi Kingston match, this left KO with nothing to do for that year's WrestleMania. And he was actually left off the card. After WrestleMania 35, KO would have Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods on the Kevin Owens show, requesting to be an honorary New Day member while Big E was out with injury, to which the New Day accepted. He would go on to eat a shit ton of pancakes and team with them later that night. And just when you thought Kevin Owens was a changed man, he would turn on the New Day and attack both Woods and Kingston. He would go on a feud with Kingston for the WWE Championship in a losing effort, but still one of Kofi's better feuds with the title. KO would then begin a short feud with Dolph Ziggler, where he would completely destroy Dolph on the mic. It should have been you eight years ago, and it was kinda, it's not going to be again. But this was really a gateway feud for Kevin Owens to get back to that Shane McMahon high. This time KO being the face and Shane being the heel. But this feud was incredibly lackluster and it took up most of Kevin Owens 2019. 
finally ending on October 4th in a ladder match where Loser leaves the company. KO was shortly after drafted to Raw, and about a month later he made a one-off appearance at NXT, joining Team Tommaso Ciampa in a War Games match and I cannot express to you how great this match was. Elsewhere, Seth Rollins would cut a promo on the entire Raw locker room. I remember around this time, there were reports going around that Seth Rollins had did the same backstage in real life and that the locker room was not happy about it. It turned out to be a false report, but WWE went ahead and used that to their advantage, and they would portray it on TV. It's also worth noting that Seth Rollins as a babyface was pretty stale at the time and this was the promo that essentially turned him heel. He was also given a stunner for his troubles. Rollins was then backed by the Authors of Pain and later Buddy Murphy. Clearly being outnumbered, KO would align himself with Samoa Joe. The two would have a great match at WrestleMania, however, it was during the pandemic era, and I feel like most things around this time didn't get the praise that it deserved. After WrestleMania 36, he had a rivalry with one-eyed Aleister Black. And maybe this wasn't a good pairing, or maybe the focus just wasn't on them, but this was a very mid feud to me. They competed in a series of matches throughout the year, including a kayfabe shoot fight that took place in that god awful Raw Underground thing they were doing. The feud would conclude October 12th, 2020, where Kevin Owens would defeat Aleister Black. Fans finally got what they were asking for when Kevin Owens was drafted to SmackDown and set to compete for Roman Reigns' Universal Championship and Roman was fresh off his feud with Jey Uso, thus beginning his official role as the Tribal Chief. After a gateway feud with Jey Uso, KO challenged Roman to a TLC match. This is one of those moments where Jey spoke out of turn, accepting the match on Roman's behalf. Roman's promo was great. This was a different Roman Reigns. He was more stoic and soft-spoken, but still savage with his delivery. I'm a gentleman. There's a lady in the ring. Grow up. The two had a great match at TLC, followed by another steel cage match. And I'd say Roman Reigns was a planetary threat at this point. You still needed the Avengers to stop him, but he didn't snap away half the universe yet. I mean beat half the roster. KO was doing some of the best work on the mic of his career as well. And it really felt like KO stepped up big during his time in the main event scene. He faced Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble in a last man standing match. It was a great match, however the finish was kinda botched. Roman was supposed to be unhandcuffed by Paul Heyman before the 10 count. And due to either a mistiming or a miscommunication, he wasn't able to be unhandcuffed in time, leaving the ref to just stand there and hold his count at 8. But if the ref continued his count, KO would have stopped Roman's title reign before it even hit one year. Still a great match though. Shortly after, he would begin another program with Sami Zayn. Because I guess, when in doubt, right? However, this was Conspiracy Sami Zayn. A completely unhinged version of Sami Zayn that doesn't get enough credit. I thought it was actually pretty good. You could have asked me about AEW. <gasps> Fine, so why was Shane McMahon in that meeting with Tony Khan? This part of their feud would culminate in a last man standing match to qualify for the Money in the Bank ladder match that was later won by Big E. He went on to have a nothing burger of a feud with Baron Corbin and was later drafted to Raw. And I never realized that every draft or shakeup that they have, he goes to the opposite brand. This time feuding with Seth Rollins again and WWE Champion Big E where KO would attack Big E and more so align himself with Seth Rollins. This was Big E's first and only world title reign, and this was arguably the best feud he had after winning it. After another failed world title hunt and a failed run at the Royal Rumble, KO would go and do something, in my opinion, bigger than the world title scene. He started trashing the state of Texas and inevitably would call out the rattlesnake himself, Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I give KO a lot of props in the build up to this match, as Stone Cold would make no appearances beforehand. It reminds me of when Bray Wyatt had to completely carry the feud against he and The Undertaker, and it really shows how over both these guys were with the crowd. Austin would accept the challenge and the two would have an unsanctioned match at WrestleMania 38. I'm assuming it was unsanctioned in order to keep the match high pace and hide any ring rust Austin might have had. This was his first match in 19 years. The match turned out pretty good and it ended up being the main event of night one. In what was one of the biggest momentum switches, after WrestleMania, he would start feuding with the iconic duo Ezekiel and Elias for months trying to convince everybody that they were the same person, which they obviously can't be because they have different names, duh. On the August 29th, 2022 episode of Raw, Bloodline members The Usos and honorary Oos, Sami Zayn, would show up and be confronted by Kevin Owens. He still remembered what the Bloodline did to him and got to talking mad disrespectful about the Tribal Chief, like he really had Jay ready to swing. This led to a match between Kevin Owens and Jay Uso, a match where Sammy had the chance to hit Kevin with a chair and he hesitated. And this hesitation cost Jay the match. 
The bloodline went back to the principal's office on SmackDown, and it wouldn't pick back up until around Survivor Series, where KO ended up being the fifth member of the Brawling Brutes and Drew McIntyre's team in War Games, facing off against the bloodline. They lost, but this renewed the feud between KO and Roman Reigns, though by this point it was too late. Roman had already had all the stones in the Infinity Gauntlet. Not only did KO have an uphill battle, but he lost his best friend and brother to a new family. KO would spend weeks trying to take down the bloodline alongside everyone else that the bloodline had wronged, while also trying to convince Sammy to leave the streets behind. I mean the bloodline. So after weeks of getting his shit pushed in, the match was set for Owens vs Reigns at the Royal Rumble. And yeah, throughout their careers, these guys have always had great matches, but this night wasn't necessarily about the match, it was about the story being told. After an incredible match, the Usos and Solo beat down KO some more, and to officially become one with the bloodline, Sammy had to hit Kevin with the steel chair, the same proposition he was given at the start of all this. Sammy decides to hit Roman with the chair instead. With one move, the cracks in the bloodline began to show, and Jey Uso's status in the bloodline was in question. The bloodline finally started to look like they were crumbling. Now it was Sammy trying to convince Kevin to team up with him, to which Kevin declined. It was on the March 17th, 2023 episode of SmackDown, where Kevin Owens would run in and save Sami Zayn from a two-on-one beatdown from the Usos, officially reuniting the two best friends and setting up a match between them and the Usos at WrestleMania 39. This match was historic being the first tag team match to main event WrestleMania. It was emotional, it was a great wrestling match in general, and it was a great ending to one of WWE's best storylines ever. And though this wasn't the end of the bloodline, it was definitely the beginning of the end. Jey Uso decided to leave the bloodline and just do his own thing. The two defended their titles against teams like Kaiser and Giovanni, pretty deadly, before eventually losing the titles to Judgment Day's Damian Priest and Finn Balor. Their title reign was pretty okay, the tag team division wasn't all that great throughout it. It was on October 13th, 2023 where it would be revealed that Kevin Owens was straight up traded for Jey Uso, this bringing him to SmackDown. Upon arriving on SmackDown, he began feuding with Grayson Waller and Austin Theory, and by association Logan Paul. And after failing to capture the US title, KO has found himself facing a new bloodline now run by Solo Sokoa. And most recently, he ran in to assist Cody Rhodes in his match against Solo Sokoa, followed by Roman Reigns' long-awaited return to the ring. Appreciative of the help against the bloodline, Cody Rhodes has granted Kevin Owens a shot at his WWE title at WWE Bash in Berlin. And although these two have seemingly been the best of pals, you never know when KO's gonna strike again. Because I'm jealous! But yeah guys, that's pretty much it. If you're new and you enjoy wrestling content, please consider subscribing. We're on the road to 5,000. Let me know in the comments anybody else's career you'd like me to cover. I'm currently working on Cesaro's, so be on the lookout for that one. And yeah, get out of here. Love you. Keep it kaze.